Did you know that Phantom Liberty added 11 hidden bosses around Dogtown? These are the Cyber Junkies, unmarked Cyber Psycho-like encounters, each of which connects to an underlying theme. In this video, we're taking a look at where to find all of them, figuring out what happened, and how they tie to wider events. So let's dive right in with number 11. Kicking things off, you'll need to come to the Anatomicon building up in Terra Cognita. And given who this dude is in reference to, it's no wonder he's one of the toughest of these hidden boss fights. There's no particular order in which you need to fight these guys, and in fact they're not even logged as quests, serving as more hidden gem variants of cyber psychos. Outside the entrance will be the first of several bodies who died attempting to flee the scene. What was initially a rave, it would seem, by reading the shard on the body of Ryan Singletree, an Arasaka trainee who took a night away from the corp in Dogtown to party and get skezzed. Sadly, things went very wrong. Inside, just one man is left standing. Or perhaps I should say dancing. Clearly vibing, at any rate. A scan names him Wesley Hunt, and a clear look at him shows he is clearly an homage to Blade, played by Wesley Snipes, sporting a similar trench coat and weapons. In fact, this entire scene feels set up to reference the opening of the first Blade movie, wherein Blade slaughters a rave of vampires who panickingly flee in a stampede. And indeed here, whilst some of the victims met their ends to Wesley's blade, others were trampled and some had purely OD'd already. The guy is a fairly tough fight, as you'd expect, but pretty short work, even on very hard, thanks to my Biako Sand Deviston build, which I've done another video on. In fact, this is also perfect for a proper blade on blade duel. With him down then, we can read the first shard. See, Blade, uh, Wesley, in this universe, was actually the one who organised this rave, and as we'll find out, he really did just want to kick back and have a good time. In fact, let's first take a look at his laptop down here to see just how much effort went into this thing. Contacting a tomb called Derek Frost, this time a reference to Deacon Frost, and Derek was in charge of publicity it seems, getting people to come along to Wesley's quote, unholy mass and Nova setup, end quote. Clearly very psyched up for what is supposed to be a three day event, complete with smoke machines, brain dances, alcohol, even hangover blockers, and importantly, a scav D DJ, who brought with him the new drug which recently started circulating from Dogtown called Fant. And now Fant is pretty much the reason everybody in this video is gonna go crazy. Basically it comes up a lot and functions like a brain dance just without the tech, allowing you to imagine something and trick your brain into experiencing it in real time. It's the means by which we're able to become Kurt Hansen during the Balls to the Wall side quest in fact, imagining Paco's story as he tells it. But what we take there is Deep Dive, a far milder, more recreationally safe dosage. Fant is about four or five times stronger than that, described as an astral plane of pure ecstasy, allowing you to experience any sense or emotion that you want. It sounds like the most addictive, euphoric, and life-changingly damaging substance one could possibly take. And you can read this info for yourself at the shack in Longshore Stacks, where you find the Xmod 2 guillotine gun. Anyway, back to Wesley's gig and the shard on his body. Turns out, after all this intense setup, Wesley just wasn't feeling the vibe of the night, disappointed and worried that his guests were looking bored. Then though, his puff of fant kicked in, and it hit hard. Hard enough for Wesley to still be proper vibing when we find him, despite the place now being empty. Now I don't know if the dude imagined the opening scene from Blade and then recreated it, or perhaps he just, I don't know, went classic cyber psycho and started slaughtering all those around him, because of fant induced cyber psychosis or something to that effect, which is going to be a repeat theme to most of these, and as the video goes on, we'll start to learn more about the story of Fant and how it came to be. Coming out of the Anatomicon then, and we might as well work our way across the map sequentially. So the next is literally a stone's throw away, up here in a wing of the Organotopia Museum that can only be accessed from the window. Inside is a woman named Maggie Isley, an ex-corporate botanist it would seem, who is now living in a roof surrounded by different plants and running experiments in an attempt to make fant a less addictive substance. We can see this on a convo between her and one Vincent D'Angelo, who warns Maggie about how toxic this 
substance is. Clearly, when we arrive on the scene, she's either been affected by this lethal stuff, or, you know, might just be a little wary, what with being a runaway corporate scientist, that someone's discovered her in her secret lair. Now, elephant in the room. Just as Wesley was a reference to Blade, Maggie clearly is a nod to Dr. Pamela Lillian Isley, aka Poison Ivy from Batman. The plants, the name, the ex-scientist, I don't know if all 11 of this lot are nods to comic book characters, but we'll see as the video goes on. On Maggie's laptop, we can further learn of her attempts to determine the mechanism of addiction, even having an ex-colleague procure her some Arasaka liver boosters to test with. And finally, Maggie's little lab can tell us the predominant composition of fans itself, that being 27% methamphetamine, 15% cannabinoids, 40% water, and 8% chemicals of entirely unknown origin to our scanners. Interesting and creepy to say the least. There's also 10% missing from that equation too, so that's even weirder. Perhaps if we hadn't stumbled in here, Maggie could have brought the growing fant crisis under control, curing its highly addictive properties, or maybe we prevented her from actually making it worse. Though my personal theory is that if we hadn't come in here when we did, she would have slowly gone insane, developed plant-based powers, and wreaked absolute terror on Night City. Although now, there's no Merkman left to stand against her. Now, head downhill a bit from the museum complex into this construction area until you come to a drop-off. Down here is a street fighter ring and a boxer named Cody Crosby, standing at the center of a very well-illustrated crime scene. Clearly, Cody went mental and started destroying the rest of these guys with heavy instruments that were lying around, namely weights. So, taking the guy down once and for all, we learn that the culprit to his mania was unsurprisingly, once again, Fant. See, Cody got kicked out of fighting throughout the rest of night's city, and forced to take his skills into Dogtown. The story there can be found on a shard between Cody and Logan Garcia from the For My Son gig in the base game, though I've only read that one through the wiki, it either didn't spawn here for me or is located elsewhere. Still, very cool that these events are all still interconnected from across the game. So, ousted from the Rancho Coronado fighting ring for killing an opponent in front of many spectators having taken too many drugs, Cody is invited to Dogtown by someone called Helena Bradley and offered up Fant to boost his prowess in the ring. I don't know, maybe imagining himself feeling no pain is the idea here? Of course, it doesn't go like that at all, and he winds up just totally sketched out. It isn't long after that before he captures the attention of another fighter, Eli Schwartzman, who, a little wary and recognizing the absolute berserker mode that Cody keeps descending into, is nonetheless forced into fighting the guy. As for the rest of what happens, well, the rest speaks for itself. Seems to be that Cody straight up killed Eli, before going full berserker mode again, and crushing any animals who didn't leave with the surrounding weights. Not a lot more to this one, just another example of Fant sending an already volatile guy over the line. I can't think of any specific pop culture characters that he'd be in reference to, so any ideas, please comment them below. Alright, next you want to come to this sort of hollow globe sculpture, where you're going to find Gary Bates, yet another guy who's totally lost his marbles and is worryingly hanging about this vantage point with a sniper. Clearly, far more paranoid than your average cyber junkie, and apparently possessing the ability to hear thoughts, according to his archived convo with Tum Matthew Choi, who questions whether it's Gary or they that have implants allowing him to hear them. But no, rather Gary just hears them, technical aid aside. And when Matthew asks if they they can hear Gary, he simply says, now, no, before dodging the question as to whether he's on something. Scanning the surrounding scene, it looks like the reason these people can't hear Gary anymore is because he took care of them, killing one woman a few hours ago, as well as shooting another guy in the head, and then bizarrely choosing to remove his clothes. Bit of a weird thing to do, but scanning the clothes themselves, the fluids allegedly contain no human genetic material, despite having been worn with visible grease stains. But surely that's impossible, as one would assume having been warned by someone, they must contain trace elements of human DNA. Equally, these could be Gary's clothes and he could have stolen this guy's, but even then, it just shifts the issue onto Gary. My immediate assumption is that one of these two guys are either a very convincing cyborg, or at the very least, sport a convincingly real-looking Borg body. That is definitely a thing in this world, it's a plot point of the No Coincident book, in fact, and Gary himself seems to be an ex-vet that potentially could have lost his organic body. His modification 
medications, driving him to the point of cyberpsychosis. Also, he wouldn't be the first Gary we know about that's able to hear the thoughts of others. And it's interesting that this guy should share a name with Co Carnage's character, given the pre-existing similarities. Coincidence? I think possibly not? I don't know. This is either another guy who just took fans and lost it, or could be a piece of a massive android cyborg conspiracy that's flying completely under the radar as of right now. I'm going to assume the former for the time being, but keep the latter in mind in case anything else comes up to further develop upon this. Moving into the Luxor Heights region of Dogtown now, the first encounter of three here is found atop this building by climbing the scaffolding beside it. Our first piece of law padding, however, is found on the ground down here, a convo between Laura Decker and Martin McGrath, who speak of a netrunner named Diana Floyd, who's capable of providing encrypted communications into Night City, and is even skilled enough to infiltrate the ice of Megacorps, it would seem. However, another of Diana's clients was a guy named Sean McMillan, and coming up to the rooftop, Sure enough, we can find Sean vandalizing the generators here. Like the rest of the junkies, he'll attack on sight, and taking him down, he'll also have a shard. A direct contact with Diana Floyd, whom he's requesting to establish for him direct communication to the Tiger Claws. Diana, however, tired of working with the junkie, is now refusing to do biz with the guy. The result of which, it would seem, was Sean seeking the poor woman out and taking revenge on her. At least, I assume this is Diana, given a shard of her personal notes is also located up here, and no doubt all of these servers are the tools required by a top netrunner. But then again, Diana's level of skill suggests she wouldn't be so easily duped by this unless caught off guard. Anywho, reading her personal notes, we can learn she has five contacts in Dogtown. Laura Decker, whom we already spoke about, that actually wanted to contact her brother in Arasaka. Sean McMillan, whom we just took down, whom she actually blocked because his calls had led to multiple server attacks. Then Jason Foreman, a fixer, who it turns out was in strong cahoots with Wakanda and who serves as a central plot point to one of Dogtown's main gigs, which are getting their own video coming soon. Finally, we have Henry James and Nella Jackson, both names I haven't seen come up anywhere else. So, overall, we know that Sean shipped drugs to the Tiger Claws, and this, I believe, is the start of Fant making its way into wider Night City. Whilst we and Diana then put a stop to the operation here, no doubt there'll be others. And I wouldn't be surprised if Fant was a more commonplace substance around the whole of Night City by the time of Ryan. Also, I've just had a realisation that I can't believe I didn't have earlier. Fant, a drug that comes up time and time again in an expansion called Phantom Liberty. Now, I'm not going to dive fully into trying to comprehend exactly what the meaning of that title was, not for this video at least, but there you go, there's an extra bit of food for thought. Was this whole thing just a psychedelic induced dream? Phantom Liberty. Just down the road again from Sean, coming to this large sort of atrium, you'll find Andrew Newman. And this guy didn't come here alone, instead part of a mercenary group who were tasked with breaking into a Biotechnica building. Now up until this point, I've fully assumed that Fant was brought in by the Scavs, at least that's what the Wesley Snipes, uh, the Hunts, Wesley Hunts encounter seemed to suggest, but after defeating Andrew and the one of his many lackeys to have actually retained a brain cell, we read otherwise, kind of, learning that Andrew and his crew stumbled upon a bunch of blocked off rooms and old lab equipment housing some weird chemicals, quote, like fertilizer or some shit, end quote. And being a professional group of mercs, Andrew and his entire crew immediately got utterly scared on the stuff, transforming this ex biotechnica lab into the set from train spotting and just, well, doing what they did in that movie. Evidently, some of the fans got exported, we've seen it enough already around Dogtown, and perhaps the scavs even managed to recreate the stuff, hence producing it at scale. After all, if a lone botanist like Maggie Isley can do it, then they could probably at least manage a cheap knockoff version. Not much more on Andrew himself, but very interesting, yet unsurprising to learn that Biotechnica is seemingly behind the terrible substance that would become fans and deep dive. Final cyber junkie of Luxor Heights now then, can be found literally below where we just were. Gotta love Dogtown's verticality, honestly. Greg Wilson is located in an underpass just across from the Heavy Hearts Pyramids, or the Ripidoc Clinic we unlock for completing Dogtown Saints, which actually links somewhat with this guy. Greg can be found accosting some low-life locals, and when I say accosting, I mean violently obliterating. But we can quickly put a stop to that. On him then is a convo with Odell Blanco, the priest that we meet at the start 
Guard of Dogtown Saints, who appoints us with rescuing his church from the scabs. Greg has been pretending to have a son, or daughter, he forgot which, using the story to try and supplement his morphine addiction. Of course, Odell isn't a total idiot, and simply refers the guy to an addiction centre in Night City. Not sure that's the best option, to be honest. I mean, we visited the mental asylum, which is practically ground zero for Biotechnica test subjects, but even still, Greg is clearly trying to take advantage and just acquire morphine. At which point, Adele stopped answering. Fair enough. Why did Greg start attacking the guys under here then? Well, there's a second chart with the answer. See, one of Greg's fellow underpass dwellers had the clever idea that the guy would get admitted to the clinic if he sustained a genuine injury. So, sort of trying to help, but also just get rid of this desperate, scary junkie, they attacked him, and Greg fought back, viciously, and won. Not entirely clear whether this guy had used Fant specifically, he was asking for morphine after all, though I'd guess that would provide a similar, yet much more mild effect. So not necessarily a Fant addict to this one, but a dangerous junkie all the same. Coming down into Golden Pacific now, and the next cyber junkie to be found will require you to head up this flight of steps just by the west gate, then quietly making your way to this alley to witness a murderous scene by one Jacqueline Peel. Acting more akin to the classic cyber psychos from the base game, having taken what is no doubt Fant at heavy hearts, causing her to black out before waking up as the perpetrator to a multiple homicide. Initially, it appears she had some remorse for her deranged actions, but decided to combat this by taking yet more more substances, very possibly more fant, kickstarting the entire process of violence yet again at the dire expense of these poor alley dwellers. It would seem she started on one, and when the others sprang to his aid, she retaliated to take out the whole bunch. The final victim we arrive just moments too late to save. Nothing tremendously special about this one, only new thing we learn is that fant has spread like wildfire throughout Dogtown. I know Heavy Hearts is probably one of the more respectable clubs in the district, but still, not entirely surprising that the stuff has made its way in there. After all, supply will be met wherever there's demand. David Dover is probably the first of this lot that I stumbled across. During the opening quest with Myers, before we make our way underground, since his little hideout is right by that subterranean car park over here in the sewers. Interesting thing to note is that if you stand directly above his hidey hole, you'll have this endless loop play of someone humming an ominous tone. Indeed, one would assume this is Fant deranged David, but even after taking him down, the ominous humming still remains. Sound bug? Or ever present cyber ghost entity? Either is possible. Anyway, heading to the tunnel underneath, you'll want to be careful of David's fairly obvious laser trip mines. Activating them will of course alert him and trigger combat, so stealthy boys will have to disable these quietly. He's probably one of the toughest fights on here along with Wesley, but using pillars and such for covers shouldn't be too bad. Once we defeat David, we learn he's been in contact with someone interesting, a woman named Julia Foreman, who tasked this merc, David, with breaking into a scav hideout and stealing an entire stash of fat, like multiple crates of the stuff to be smuggled out of Dogtown. Now, it's interesting that this Julia woman should be clued in about scav business, since Jason Foreman, from one of the gigs, worked as a Dogtown fixer who maintained those sorts of connections, likely making Julia then either a sister or Jason himself adopting a female alias for some reason. Though reading the file on Jason's laptop, it sounds as though Julia isn't actually Dogtown based, suggesting maybe her and Jason are family, where he provides Dogtown info and she outsources from around wider Night City like she's done with David. Anyway, the guy got the stuff, but didn't account for Bargest and the Scavs being in cahoots. So, with pretty much all of Dogtown's armed forces then hunting him, was forced into the sewer where we find him to lay low for a bit. Of course, having been kicked out of his gang, cut off from his family, and now left alone with nothing but his own thoughts, it unsurprisingly wasn't long before David sought some form of escape. So, riskily venturing outside to hook up to a nearby generator, he was able to force the lock on one of these crates and access the fant therein, taking no less than 13 doses when all was said and done. Interestingly, he also logged some of his experience, claiming that despite sitting in the dark alone, he felt utterly euphoric, like all the bad shit in his life had fallen away and everything was going 
great by dose 5, he noted there was no build-up of tolerance and the feeling of ecstasy was strong as ever, a feeling he never wanted to end. By dose 7, he'd concluded that he would no longer ever again leave, that nothing in life could be as good as what he had in that sewer, including him, his bed, and his fans. Of course, this didn't change the external reality that he was now nothing but a scared out lunatic hiding in a sewer, but it did mean he was willing to kill anyone who attempted to disturb his perfect reality. Scanning the inhalers, there's another key detail here. This fant, allegedly, was produced in and thus shipped from the USSR. No doubt it was an airdropped package at some point or another, but the Andrew Newman encounter suggested the drug was found as some old biotechnica fertilizer under Dogtown. So, either these two events took place along a more stretched timeline than is suggested, with samples shipped to the USSR SSR, quickly reproduced and then shipped back, mass produced, or more likely, the Biotechnica fertilizer isn't fat at all, but just something similar. Maybe that batch of fertilizer even got leaked to the USSR years ago, giving them time to develop it into the substance known as fats, hence the similarities. Either way, David Dover is a clear example of just how insanely addictive this stuff can be. Heading out of that sewer and taking an immediate left though, and the next guy was practically living next door to David, though it was only after getting rid of David and skipping time ahead that he actually spawned for me. Chester Hamilton's story is pretty straightforward, as they go. Dude was kicked out of the NCPD, moved to Dogtown, joined Barguest, but was somehow kicked out of them as well. He doesn't explain, but clearly the dude feels wronged, since when his tomb suggests he returned to Night City, Chester decides to get a little revenge first by screwing with Barguest's generators. And, just to give himself that little extra push, the courage to vandalise the property of 6th Street on steroids, three guesses what Chester decides to take. It's actually never confirmed to be fans, but at this point, what else is it gonna be? Cuts to Vincent Montez, just one of the guards, and he's been given orders to deal with this recruit turned vandal once and for all. Reluctant, because Chester was formerly a buddy of sorts, but orders are orders, especially in an organisation as brutal as Barguest. Of course, all this meant for Vincent was a shot to the head anyway, the generator still got fried, and in the end it was up to us to put this cyber junkie down. I don't think we can entirely blame this guy's actions on fans, but it certainly helped tip him over the edge. Final cyber junkie to be found in Dogtown then is in the basketball court of Longshore Stacks, though I did have a little trouble getting him to spawn. I'd recommend visiting at various different times of day and night until he crops up. Jacob Bernard is an ex-subject of the Sports Academy that we visit during the Talent Academy gig, and is actually a clear-cut example of someone we get to meet who, despite going on to be a champion basketball player for a time, still suffers irreparable damage thanks to all the implants and things done to him from a young age at this awful place. Listen to the childlike way he recounts this incredibly incoherent story when we come across him. And then there's also this. I'll tell you a secret, if you eat 120 kidneys, you can grow one back. Couple the strange words with the children's backpack, and it would appear as though the mental damage sustained has caused him to regress to a childlike state of being, who voices utter gibberish. Thematically, it would make sense that there's fans in his system doing the talking, and as we'll see, the guy has clearly had issues with substance abuse. On him is a communication to his mother, asking what she did with his championship ring, to which she explains that he'd already pawned it years ago for drugs, another indication that the guy is suffering from memory loss in the same way someone with dementia might. After this, his mother heartlessly blocks him, leading to feelings of worthlessness, no doubt making the prospect of fans a more attractive one. So, stumbling onto the court earlier this very evening, Jacob is recognised as the 2072 interstate champion with the Toronto Falcons, though in the five years following, he's clearly fallen from as high to about as low as one can get, now simply scaring some kids away from their neighbourhood basketball courts. Two locals decide to have a plan 
slight word with Jacob, try and deal with the situation, and it goes pretty much as you could guess, considering most shards are found on the bodies of the deceased. Drugged up Jacob, basically beat them all to death. Finally, on the bench, we can read some medical info on Jacob himself. Just 24 years old, Guy is way too young to be suffering with issues to his memory. But due to the operations, both neural and muscular, that he underwent as a child, Jacob needs to take medications to dial down aggression, delusions, and general hyperactivity. All side effects of what's making him a champion player to begin with. However, what the Academy failed to take into account with this, or just didn't care about, is the fact that Jacob's necessary medications would worsen his overall states when all used in tandem, resulting in a vicious cycle of getting continually worse whether he took the medication or not. It would seem, after attaining fame and fortune and everything that goes with it, Jacob spent the next five years on a downward spiral, as he dealt with OCD, ADHD, PTSD, and delusions, finally transforming him into nothing more than another cyber junkie, which we have to take down one night in some back alley basketball court. I'll expand on this again in the Dogtown Gigs video when we go over the details of the Talent Academy gig properly, but for now, Jacob is definitely an example for why we absolutely should get that place shut down. Anyway, that's all 11 cyber junkies that are known about. If you find any more of these guys, please comment it below. I wouldn't be surprised if we see Fant has become something of an epidemic across Night City come the time of Orion, if of course this is still the setting for that game. Massive thanks, as always, to the patrons for helping me to make more content like this. And of course, thank you for watching. I'm Sam Bram, and I'll see you soon in another video.